Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Babcock, and welcome to Lecture 2, Using Historical Context to Understand the Book of Exodus. The Bible was written a long time ago, in a faraway place, to a people with different customs and language than our own. This lecture teaches how to use an understanding of history to better understand God's message in Exodus. To accomplish this goal, we will break the study into two parts. First, we need to study the background of the entire book. And second, we will study the background of specific passages in the book. For the second point, we will spend some time exploring Exodus 20. Background information learned about the book as a whole provides a better understanding into its overall setting and provides a general perspective for each passage. It is the lens through which we interpret. But each individual passage also requires its own independent study to explain the historical cultural factors that are relevant to the passage. Before studying a particular passage, it is important to study the historical cultural background of each book. This includes pertinent facts about the writer and editor, recipients, date, and purpose of the book. To begin this study, students should consult a Bible or a study Bible, commentaries, Bible dictionaries, or a biblical survey introduction to the book. When possible, students should read through the entire book in one sitting to gain an appreciation for the biblical book as a whole. Concerning the author, Students should research matters and identify the writer's identity, characteristics, position among God's people, relationship with the recipients, and circumstances at the time of writing. This information will help you understand the book from the perspective of the writer. In addition, we should, should explore what we know about the first hearers. What are their circumstances, their characteristics, and who are they as a community? Viewing the book through this dual lens helps us understand why the author included some information while omitting other information. Date is another key historical cultural factor. Knowing when a book was written or when events occurred enables the student to look outside the text for contemporary historical cooperation and insights. Turning to the book of Exodus, the traditional view supports Mosaic authorship. We have substantial internal evidence supporting that view. Moses is said to have spoken or written materials contained in the book, and we see that in the Song of Moses through the use of first person I, we and our I, we and my uh, when writing. During the account of the war with the Amalekites, Moses is instructed by God to write this in a memorial book. So we have God telling Moses to write down what is occurring. There are additional examples, and later Jewish and Christian scriptures attest to Moses' role as the substantial author of Exodus. In addition, the picture of a scribe recording contemporary events is in complete harmony with ancient Near Eastern practices. However, there is also evidence of later editing of the book. We have third person narratives, including uh, the praise of Moses. We have parenthetical insertions, designed to bring a later audience up to date, and we have a modernization of terminology and geographical place names. Some of these may be the work of a scribe under the direction of Moses, but some point to a later addition to the book. 
we can conclude that the basic structure of the book of Exodus and its chief components were established by Moses or carried out under his supervision. Later revisions were added in a manner consistent with procedures in the ancient Near East for literature, likely completed at the time of the prophet Samuel. The original recipients are the people of Israel in the desert prior to entry into Canaan. However, even at its original writing, the book is intended as an etiology for later generations explaining how the Israelites were saved from slavery in Egypt, received the law, and sojourned in the desert. Essentially, the purpose of the book is to narrate the acts of God which established Israel as a nation. As such, the book is divided into three sections. The first, deliverance of God's people from slavery in Egypt. Second, a covenant at Sinai. And third, God's presence in the tabernacle. Through the support of archaeology, we can place the Exodus narrative in its historical context. If we look at the beginning of Exodus, chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, it reads, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. These words fit the timing and context of Seti I. Seti I was the first of a line of warriors who turned all efforts towards recovering Egypt's prestige abroad. As soon as Seti came into the throne, he faced serious danger from a coalition of Syrian states who were encouraged by the Hittites. He was able to defeat the coalition and enabled Egypt to regain control over Canaan. After repulsing a Libyan attack, we find Seti once again in northern Canaan, where Egyptian troops came into contact with the Hittites for the first time. Seti captures the city of Kadesh. Although the Hittites were forced to retreat tempor temporarily, they retained their influence in northern Canaan and Syria. These wars were on the mind of Seti I and his son, Ramses II. At the time of Exodus in chapter 1, and Seti I would have viewed the Israelites as being closely linked to the Canaanites and concerned about there being an enemy lurking within his borders. Therefore, the words of this passage fit the historical situation. The passage continues in verse 11. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service. In mortar and brick and all the kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. These passages are also understood in their historic context. Because Ramses II was concerned about war with Canaan, he ordered slaves to create a storage facility with supplies readying Egypt for war. One of these facilities was in the district of Goshen in northern Egypt, and the city was called P. Ramses, or the House of Ramses. This location is likely the place mentioned in verse 11. Looking at another storage facility near Ramses II's temple, 
we find a mud brick storage room similar to those mentioned in the Bible. In addition, paintings on the tomb walls with, uh, from the period show a Semitic people being forced to make mud bricks. Through these short examples, we can see that understanding the historic context of a passage helps us understand the mind of the king of Egypt and why he behaved the way he did towards the Israelites. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in Lecture 3.